Hey, I'm Scott Nitton, I'm the pastor at Missouri City Campus, and we've been answering your questions about the book of Psalms. And our friend Yardley Kennedy's been helping us out. Yardley's a great guy, one of the smartest guys I know, part of our advisory team. He's a former professor at Houston Baptist University and leads our Bible college as well. So he's a great guy to ask these questions. These are great questions about the book of Psalms, the Bible, stuff to help us understand it better. So Yardley, here's the next question. The book of Psalms seems different than the rest of the Bible. Could you explain to me how it fits? Two of the uh, poetical books are considered didactic, and that would be Proverbs and Psalms. And by di didactic, uh, it simply means that they're there and intended to teach or instruct. Uh, so Psalm, the Psalms, the book of Psalms, is a didactic book intended to teach or instruct. It covers the entire range of, of, of emotion. Uh, we should not be hesitant to, uh, to express our fears and our uncertainties and our struggles and, and our issues, uh, just as, as the psalmist did. Uh, so in terms of how it fits in, you know, it, it's just a, a great model uh, to, to, to show us what that connection should look like. Well, I hope you are looking at the book of Psalms, that you're looking through it, you're studying, you're picking a few out. They're not in chronological order. It doesn't necessarily tell a story, although there's some building involved there. Skip around a little bit. If you've got ADD like me, this is the perfect book for you, okay? Just pick a, one out, and that's what I'm doing here on this deal. Thank you, Yardley, for sharing with us. It's a different kind of book. We read it different, we, we look at it different, we, we study it different, and it teaches us deep within our soul. It really does touch us in a, in a, in a deep way. When you, you see the, the triumph of the human spirit and the agony of the human defeat in this book, it's just really quite amazing. So I'm glad you're here for it. Welcome to those at Missouri City Campus. I'm glad you're there at Elkins High School. Go by and see Scott Denton. He'd love to help you get plugged in. Uh, fill out that welcome card. I know it's too late for that, but fill it out anyway. Turn it in over there. We want to know who you are. And welcome to those watching on riverpoint.tv. My mom always watches. And so mom, hi to you and Sweet Pea and the gang, the quilting gang up there. It's a biker gang. It's a biker gang that makes quilts. Expect to see my mom arrested any day now. So no, they're very well-behaved people. So anyway, so anyway, while well, we're in this deal, last week we talked about Psalm 27. It was really helpful for me. Great reminder that somehow, some way, our relationship with God is supposed to be so intimate and filled with faith that we are able to disconnect our circumstances when they're bad with our sense of hope, that we're not to place our sense of hope in our circumstances. God's the same yesterday, today, and forever, and sometimes we have good days and sometimes we have bad days. There are seasons of defeat and there are seasons of triumph. But God never changes. And so David was talking in Psalm 27 about that. You can get the uh, talk about that uh, you know, online for free or pick it up somewhere. It's great. And then today we're talking about Psalm 19. I kind of threw you off because last week I said we're going to be in Psalm 9. And I, and I don't know what I was thinking because I went to Psalm 9 as I started studying. I go, I don't want to teach this. And uh, I go, oh, no, it was Psalm 19 what I want to teach. So some of you are going to be angry at me because you've been studying Psalm 9 all week. Psalm 9 is a great psalm by David again. And it talks about the word of God. And I wanted to just, I, to me, it meant so much. And I think sort of the, 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 cru the crux of the psalm, so it's a short psalm, but the crux of the psalm is found in Psalm 19, verse 12 and 13. Here's what he, David says here. Are y'all with me, by the way? How about you, Missouri City? Is everybody here? Yes. Okay, you look a little sleepy this morning here. So here we go. Who can discern his errors? That's sort of the... The whole theme of the book. Who can discern his errors? I love this question because it, it puts out there this idea that you might not know when you're wrong. Your wife always knows when you're wrong. <laughs> you don't know when you're wrong. That's, a, that's an interesting concept. That you might not know when you're wrong. You just, it just sneaks up on you. Hindsight's 20-20, but you know, in real time, this is tough, and it was tough for David. 
And I love this question because he goes back in the verses before this and even after it and kind of dresses this idea. Who can discern his errors? Declare me innocent from hidden faults. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sin. See how he's praying here? He's, he's, he's recognizing in his life how susceptible he is of being wrong and not even knowing it. He's praying to God that God would declare him innocent from hidden things that he doesn't even know about. Have you ever prayed that way? Have you ever said, God, it's easy to pray this way, God, forgive me for this, forgive me for that, forgive me for the other thing. I started reading stuff like this from David especially, and I started saying, and forgive me for all the things I don't even know I did wrong. I mean, that, that's amazing. It's a humbling prayer to prayer because you get to thinking, I wonder what I did wrong and I don't even know about I don't want to know about it. You know, it's that kind of deal. And David had a sense of this. Keep back your servant from presumptuous sin. Let them not have dominion over me. Let me not be controlled by this sin in my life, is what he's saying here. This presumptuous sin, this arrogant sin, this hidden sin. I don't even know when I'm wrong sometimes. Then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. So, so David, a man after God's own heart, which we've described him before as, is talking about how to walk uprightly. How to have this relationship with God that's authentic and real. And, and how to be honest. And he talks about it in a couple different ways. He talks about it in chapter 19, verse 1 through 6, in a way that nobody is going to have an excuse in terms of knowing God. And he talks in these first six chat verses about God's natural revelation. About the, the, the sun coming up and the sun going down and the moon coming up and the moon going down and the beauty of the land and the beauty of the sea. It's like Romans chapter 1. If you ever read Romans chapter 1, it's like no one is, everyone's without excuse because just by looking at God's beauty, you have to come to a point where you say, somebody made this. So, I mean, even, even an atheist is going to be awakened one day to realize, oh, there's somebody behind this. And that's what David's hitting on. There's this natural revelation in the first six verses of the scripture. And then he gets to this word of God. Then he gets to what it is that God spoke. Now, we don't know exactly what it is that he was talking about. I talked to Yardley about that this week. And uh, he runs our Bible college here on the Richmond campus. And we were talking about that, that they had the Pentateuch, the first five, five books of the Bible, the law, which is Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. I'm just showing off now. Anyway, so I went, to, I went to seminary. Anyway, so those five books. But he's also talking about this oral tradition that was happening through prophetic um, guys like Samuel and Nathan. Nathan it is Nathan. And, um, and uh, is that right? I think it is. Uh, well, Yardley will correct me after the sermon. So, but Sam, it, so it's this idea that God spoke... The first five books of the Bible, it, we got that. It's a written tradition. It's not as much as we have today. But also, that there's this, these prophets. God spoke through these prophets. And there was a great oral tradition that was going on there. That's kind of how it was before the printing press. This is kind of how things were communicated, right? And he's talking about the word of the Lord. Now, we take God's word in a way that we try to understand. And what I want you to think about as we look at this psalm is I want you to think about your own attitude toward the Bible. Because this is really important. Some of you didn't grow up in church, like me, okay? We didn't grow up in church, so I don't even know when, I, I, don't, I didn't grow up in the Bible, we didn't quote the Bible, I didn't go to church, I wasn't studying the Bible, I, didn't, I knew of a Bible, I knew what a Bible was, I didn't own one. Some of you grew up like that. So the Bible is like uh, really kind of a mysterious book to you. Some of you grew up in church, but that church didn't encourage you to read your Bible. The priest read the Bible or the, or the pastor read the Bible, but you didn't read the Bible. And, and some of you um, uh, grew up uh, very Bible literate. You understood the Bible and you read the Bible. So, but, but you have an attitude toward the Bible, okay, through the Scripture. We're going to make the application, even though that's not exactly what David was talking about. He's talking about probably the first five books, the, the law. He was also talking about these prophets in his life, these oral tradition. But I think it applies to all of God's Word, which we say is the Bible. And I want you to think about this because here's the deal. What David's going to teach us today about God's truth and about God's word is so helpful for our life in every, every way. And it's your attitude 
toward the Bible. As a pastor, I talk to people a lot, and, and I, I'll say this question as we, as we talk about life's issues. I'll say, well, what does the Bible say? And you're surprised that people are intimidated by the Bible. That they don't even, now, if you have a King James Bible, uh, keep that. That's your family Bible. Put it on a shelf. Weigh a pie. Okay? And then get you an uh, English Standard Version, a New Century Version, or an NIV Version. All those are available here at the Richmond campus on the, in the bookstore. I think we even have some down in Missouri City. So, or, or, or steal a Bible. We have Bibles at both campuses. Just steal it. Just take it. Run. I love that. I know some people that email me later, I, I took your advice and stole a Bible. I said, I was just kidding about that, man. <laughs> you, didn't, you didn't actually take it, did you? They said, yeah. You want me to bring it back? I said, no, I'm just kidding about that. You know, so anyway. So take the Bible. Okay, so but what's your attitude? What's your knowledge? Like if we had a Bible drill right now, how would you do? How would you do? You know, you know if, I, if I ask you to look up the b- book of Hezekiah, would you know that the book of Hezekiah is not in the Bible? Gotcha. Again, I'm just showing off, okay? So it's that idea. It's like, listen, this is the thing. Here's the thing that I found, and then I will get to it. I've had so many people say that they didn't believe in the Bible, and yet as I ask and talk to them about it, you recognize pretty quick, and they do too, this is a book they don't believe in, and yet they've never looked at. They've never studied. So I'll say to them, what specifically don't you believe in? Help me find that piece of the Bible that you don't find is true. Because that's what we like to do. If we can categorize the Bible as an antiquated group of stories that dictate some sort of history and tell us about this good guy Jesus, then it doesn't really relevant, it's not relevant at all in our lives. But if it's what God says it is, which is alive, then all of a sudden there's something relevant here. So regardless of where you're coming from today, I want you to leave today with the understanding that the Bible is alive and helpful and authoritative in your life. This is what David said. Here's what he says about it. He says, the law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, Enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true, the righteous and righteous altogether. So, in this passage here, these two passages, seven, eight, and nine, I guess there's three passages here, yeah, seven, eight, and nine, there is six descriptions of God's word. He, he, he's really trying to give us a holistic understanding of God's word. And he says these things about it. He says it's perfect, he says it's uh, sure, it says it's right. He says it's pure, it's also clean, it's also true. Is that six? Yeah, one, two, three, four, five, six. That's it. True. That's what it is. And these six things are, and we're going to talk about most of them today. You know, these six things are something about God's word that you should know about because he takes these six things and he says it does six things for our lives. Here's the six things he says it does. He says, one, it restores the soul. Two, it make wise the simple, okay, making wise the simple, rejoicing the heart, makes you glad, enlightening the eyes, it also endures forever, it also righteous, it's righteous altogether. So those are the six things that it does, okay? So, so David is trying to say something pretty big here. The other thing about this passage, in, in, in poetical literature is really important on how it's constructed, it's really important how it's constructed. And he, he's making a point by how it's organized. Okay? So the way it's organized here is he says, the law of the Lord, the testimony of the Lord, the precepts of the Lord, the commandment of the Lord. You get the point? Uh, the, t- the fear of the Lord, the rules of the Lord. Who do you think this is about? Of the Lord. Right. And the word that's used there is the, is the covenant word for Yahweh God, the creator. It's used in scripture because what, what David wants us to know and what we ought to know is that this is a divine book. This is not a human book. This is a divine, inspired, faultless, without error book. This is of God. It's a divine book. In fact, in the New Testament, we read it this way in 2 Timothy. It says this. 
All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. So the Scripture is God breathed out. Somebody said, well, you can't believe all the Bible. Somebody told me that. A pastor told me that. I nearly slapped him. And then, but I thought that would be rude. And I just met the guy. And I, you can't believe all the Bible. The Old Testament is just a collection of stories. And I said, well, I don't think that's true. And I hope it's not true. Because here's what I do know. I do know this. I'm not smart enough to figure out what's right and what's wrong. God says it's all God breathed. It's all profitable. It's all without error. It's all from God. And so if you read this book, and this book is the, the kind of book that says, okay, these are just supposed to inspire you, you'll miss it. You'll miss totally the idea of what God's trying to do. He's not trying to inspire you. I mean, I know we got all this Jesus junk on our cars and key rings and bumper stickers, all that stuff. I'm just saying that... You know, and these, these Bible verses that we memorize, those are important. But the, the book isn't supposed to inspire you. It's supposed to change your life. It's supposed to be transforming of your soul, okay? So we're going to look at that. Here's what God's Word in these passages of Scripture are supposed to do, okay? He says this. It says that, that it, is, it is the law. It's how he describes God's Word. It's the law. It's the testimony. It's precepts. It's commandments. It's the fear. It's rules, okay? So let's, let's look at this, okay? This is exhaustive. I mean, we haven't even gotten to the sermon yet. I mean, you think David's trying to tell us something here? You think God's trying to say something about his word here to us? I mean, look how comprehensive this is. And let, let me just hit on a couple of these things. We won't have time for everything, so study it for yourself. But the first thing he talks about is the fact that he says, the law of the Lord is perfect. Now, this is an unusual Hebrew word. It doesn't mean perfect like imperfect perfect. It, it really means perfect in terms of uh, complete. That the God's, the law of the Lord is complete. It, it, it's, it's from this Hebrew idea of being comprehensive. It's, it, it, it's all-sided. That's a good way to say it. Nothing can be taken from it and nothing can be added to it. It's everything it needs to be. It's comprehensive. It's flawless. Its set of instructions is completely sufficient for me for one reason. And here's what, what it is. It is for the restoring of my soul. The Bible is about restoring your soul. That God, the creator, your creator, who created you as body, mind, and soul. And the Bible is written to restore your soul. Now, that's important to understand because a lot of people believe the Bible is written as a rule book. That this is what you do and don't do. We're kind of pragmatic when it comes to church. It's like, just tell me what to do and I'll do it. Or tell me what not to do and I'll do it. What about those Ten Commandments and all that? And we want to make it sort of a list of rules and roads and do's and don'ts. And pastors, those are good sermons to preach. They're easier sermons to preach, by the way, because we can say things like, well, good Christians don't do this and good Christians do do this. Oh, I said do do. Anyway, so... Um, <laughs> So it's that idea where we like to do that, but that's not the purpose of the book. The purpose of the book wasn't about moral reform, reforming you morally. It was about restoring your soul. It was about the dead coming alive. It was about a resurrection. It was about darkness coming into light. It was about you being dead and made alive again. It was about being reborn. It was about speaking to the depths of your soul, the inner parts of who you are that lives on for eternity. It was about this idea of resurrection in your life. That God wrote it down so you'll know who he is and who you are in the world you're living in so your, sto your soul could be restored. It's not a moral book because here's the deal. If God can restore your soul, capture your soul, touch your soul, your behavior will follow. In fact, when God does write down, don't do this and do this and all that kind of stuff, he's, he's typically listing those things as a way for you to understand that something's out of whack in your relationship with him. If you're not real careful, and Bible-believing people do this quite often, you'll become a legalist. 
You'll think this book was written for you to live up to. By the way, you can't. If you think you are, come see me. <laughs> or, here's, what church, here's where churches really mess up. They believe it's the book that they're supposed to be enforcing for the culture we live in. And so we're trying to reform everybody else's behavior. And it's clear here in this first scripture that we're reading in verse 7 that the law of the Lord is perfect for reviving the soul. It's, the scripture is not targeted for a fix in, in, the, in the temporal. It's about eternal change in your, in your soul. Then he says the testimony of the Lord is sure. Sure. So we, first we got perfect, and then we've got sure. we got these two ideas here. And what is sure? It's the testimony of the Lord. Now, we all know what a testimony is. It's when you, like in a, in a legal sense, you get up on a, and you swear to tell the truth, and you, and you tell your story. You tell what you saw. You tell you what you, you believe. You tell what you know, and, 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 and you give a testimony. In church circles, we understand that because if you go, you give a testimony of what God's done in your life and how you've changed. Those are all good and important things. But this, and that's what this kind of idea is that this book, the, the, the test is, is the God's testimony about himself and God's testimony about you. It's God's testimony about the world. It's God's testimony about eternity. And it's sure, which means you can count on it. Whatever he says in here about himself and about you and about the future is going to happen. It's sure. You can depend on it. See, see, I wasn't there when Noah built the ark. I just know it happened. You know why? Because God said it did. And, and, and I know you're saying, well, that's kind of outrageous. I know. And here's what I've kind of realized as I get older. And you may need to get older to realize this. My whole life experience isn't exhaustive in terms of truth. I wasn't there. I wasn't there when Jesus died on the cross. I, I believe it happened. I wasn't there when he rose from the dead, but I believe it happened. You see, and we get this arrogant point of view where we say, I got to see it to believe it. And when you live like that, you won't have any faith. And so what God's saying is the testimony I'm giving about myself, about my redemptive process, about how you can be forgiven, about how to have a relationship, about how to have abundant life. You can count on that. It's sure. It's true. Test and see. You can depend on it. He doesn't want you to say, oh, I wonder if that's true. He's saying, this is what God said. And we, we do that. We, we say, well, I know the Bible says this, but. And we'd rather depend on our own understanding. And the Bible's pretty clear. It says uh, a man does what's right in his own eyes, and the way and the end of that is destruction. See, see, God provides this sure way so we don't have to be dependent on just our thinking, our belief system, or our life experience. That we can have a sure way, even though we didn't live this way all the time, we understand God's surety because he gave us a testimony about it. And we can believe it. I heard the story. The next thing it says here is the precepts of the Lord are right. Now, precepts are doctrines. This is doctrine. These are not suggestions. They have authority in our life. These are truths. They're right. They're right on every time. They, they apply. It's the right path. His precepts lay out a right path. And what it does is it creates this rejoicing of the heart. So the question in that passage is where do you get your joy? I mean, God talks a lot about the fact that we have this book, this word of God, that tells us that what God's doctrines are, these truths that are that are absolutely true, that we can depend on our life, and they're right, and we don't have to wonder what's right or what's wrong. This is how we become universalist. We, 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 we come to the conclusion that all roads lead to heaven, and everybody's going, and it's all good, and your way's as good as my way, and truth becomes abstract, and everybody's truth is a good truth, and no truth is really absolute truth. And David would say, no, 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 God's doctrines are right. Regardless of what you believe, there is a truth. And God's asking us to seek his truth. And we'll find his truth. And so, so the, the, the idea of deception is the idea that you believe something right now to be true that's not true. Or you believe something that's not true that is true. And because you believe that way, and I believe that way about something, it's usually revolving around your teenage children... 
Think about it. <laughs> We're deceived. And David's saying, hey, don't trust in your thoughts. Don't trust in just your ideas. Don't trust in just your life experience, your, your, your school of hard knocks. Trust in God's truths, his doctrines. Then he says here, he says, he, he, he said, I'll, I'll go through these last ones quick. The commandments of the Lord, they're pure. The fear of the Lord, that's clean, um, meaning, meaning there's a sense of awe about it. It's a Hebrew word that kind of leads us toward this word called worship. This the awe is just big. It's immense. And the last thing he says is the rules of the Lord are true and, and righteous altogether. It means whatever God says is right is right. I mean, how many times have you thought or heard somebody say, well, I just don't think it's right, and then we, we presume on God. Remember what David was praying at the beginning of this? God, don't let any presumptuous sin dominate me. I don't even know when I'm wrong. And then he begins this, this idea of what God's word, and look at what he says here about our attitude toward it, and we'll be done. It says, God's word is more to be desired, sorry, more to be desired are they than gold. Even much fine gold, which is a better, I guess, sense of gold. Sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned, and keeping them there is great reward. Look at those last two things. By finding, searching God's word, by placing your life in God's hands, by understanding God's word, what David is saying here is there to be desired more than wealth, more than prestige, more than most of the things that we're pursuing in our life, success, popularity in school, I mean, whatever it is, right? I mean, God, this is the number one thing, God's truth, God's word, God himself. And he says, by these words of God, your servant is warned. In keeping them, he's rewarded. I wonder how many times in heaven, I'm not sure how heaven's going to play out, by the way. But I wonder how many times we're going to try to pull this with God. I didn't know. I, I didn't know. R really? And he's going to say, yeah. That's why I wrote it down. <laughs> I wanted you to know. You never read it. Well, how was I supposed to know? Read the book. <laughs> <laughs> but see how God puts the responsibility on you? And on me, you're not going to have an. I'm not going to have an excuse because he wrote it down. He inspired people to write it down, and they were so inspired by the Holy Spirit, it's without error. Here's what Jesus says in John chapter eight. Go to that verse, John chapter eight, verse thirty-one. It says this: If you abide in what's those, that word? My word, okay? This is the word Jesus was talking at this time about the gospel. It wasn't the New Testament yet. It wasn't written yet. You are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will say it. Set Come on, Missouri City, say it one more time. The truth will what? Set It'll set you free. And the ideal here is this truth, the truth of God, not your truth, not the truth you created, but God's truth is the path to freedom. And everything else will dominate your life. Your appetites, your addictions, your sin. My sin, I, listen, we're in this together. If you don't live under the authority of God's word, you're just going to do the best you can. Here's what you're going to do. You're going to do, and I'm with you, so I feel like I'm being so judgmental today. I don't mean to be. You're going to do what you think is right. And the idea for the follower, for the disciple, is to do what you believe God says is right. Regardless of what other people think. Regardless of what our culture says. Regardless of what the norms are. 
So that's what he's saying here about this truth. The truth is that the idea here is that we're supposed to desire God's word. So in 2016, we're just getting started here. This is your call to action. I'm, I'm telling you, I'm warning you, I'm helping you, I'm encouraging you. Pick up a Bible. Start reading it. Start in the book of John. Every time Jesus mentions something about himself, write it down. Think about it. Pray it. Then go to the book of Galatians. That's a great book. Don't start in Revelation. It'll freak you out. <laughs> totally and completely freak you out. Or Daniel. I like Daniel. But, or, or Leviticus. Genesis, starting about chapter 12, is cool. The first 11 chapters are good, too, but it happens quick. If you don't know where to start, help call me. Don't let this book get in your head like, oh, man, it's just too, I just don't know. Because I'm telling you, you get in here, and you start reading it, and you go, what? And here's, here's the idea that Paul was writing when he wrote to Timothy. He, and, and this has happened to me. I'll give you one example. I got to get my glasses on. I told you I was getting old. Let me, let me give this example here. 20 years ago, 19 years ago, I was praying about starting a church in Fort Bend County, Texas. And I was scared to death. And I was asking God for an out and a direction. I had four small children. And he gave me this passage, and, and he said, I'm telling you, it jumped off the page. And I'm not, like, emotional like that or freaky, you know, but I'm reading. And I'm saying, God, I'm going to go down there and start. You know, it's me, right? God, you know, you're asking me to go do this thing, and it's going to fail. And I got four children, and I'm going to be embarrassed, and I don't want to go live with my mother-in-law. At all. <laughs> and, and I was reading the, in the passage of scripture. And it says. No one whose hope is in you. Will ever be put to shame. And it was like God jumped off the pages. Of that book and said. Put your hope in me Patrick. And you won't be put to shame. Now, that was not a promise for success. It was just, I read it as a promise I wouldn't have to live with my mother-in-law. But um, <laughs> I didn't know what it was going to be, you know. I didn't know where that was going to go, but I said, okay. It was God's word. It was God's word that moved me here to start this church. Now, my wife had been telling me for four months, we're going to be fine. God's with us. God's leading us to do this. And I was chickening out, and I read that verse. No one whose hope is in you will ever be put to shame. I'm telling you, this is God's breathed word. It quickened my spirit. It strengthened my soul. It restored my faith. It motivated me to move. We took great risk because of what God said. That's the way it's supposed to work. And you'll never get that experience unless you pick up this book. You'll never get This isn't a book, so you'll know more. This is a book so God can speak into your life where you're living right now. What you're struggling with right now. Now, you have to be careful because you can, don't interpret everything. You get some help. You know, it's, you got to be careful. So there's a bit of caution here. You, gotta, you can't take a passage of Scripture that was meant for one purpose and apply it to your situation if it doesn't apply. So i got to give you some warning there because a lot of people say, well, God told me to do that. And I said, where do you get that? And they tell me, and I go, that's not what God meant there at all. Your whole life is screwed up. <laughs> and they go, really? Yes. This is why you should never come to me for counseling, by the way. God did not intend for you to do that with that passage. The prosperity gospel is one of them. This is a total misappropriation of God's truth, by the way. It's, that's free, by the way. So anyway, 
So the point is, desire this more than anything else in your life. Get up in the morning and read a proverb. There's 31 proverbs. In a month, you'll read the whole book. Just read it. Get a Bible and write in it. Somebody said, well, I don't want to write in God's Word. Well, and then I said, well, how often are you reading it? And they said, well, not very often. I said, okay, well, if you're not reading it, what, 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 what's writing have to do with anything? You know, just pick it up, read it, write it. Mine's all up. I just realized today that my Bible is coming apart. <laughs> I got to glue, get a glue stick and put it together, you know. Tear it up, you know. I mean, eat it up. Get in it. This is the thing that's going to make your life work. This is, listen, here's, here's the last thing. The reason I think we avoid this as adults is simple. We don't want the authority over us. We like doing what we want. And if we heard from God, it puts us in a bind. And we don't like that. I may be. I'm just guessing. I know when I'm not walking with the Lord, I don't read my Bible. Because I don't want to hear from God. I'm avoiding like that. So desire this above gold or anything else in your life. And see if your life isn't blessed. I promise you it will be. Let me pray for us, okay? Father in heaven, thank you for we live in a day and age, unlike David, that has your total counsel here. We have everything we need in the scripture to know who you are, to know our life, to know our world we live in, to know how to have a relationship with you, to know how to follow you, know how to repent, know how to seek forgiveness and forgive others. We know something about you in a way that's transforming, and I know many people here are looking for answers from you. May they start with your scripture. May they start in the word. May they depend on it. And if you're here and you're praying right now, I just want to encourage you to make this one decision today. This is kind of a trick, so as you pray, be careful here. This is what, full disclosure, this is a little bit of a trick. Just decide, even though you don't know what the Bible says completely, just make a decision today that the Bible is going to be the authority in your life. Just say, God, I don't know what it says. I don't know what it's supposed to tell me to do or not do or whatever that thing, I'm, I'm supposed to, the way I'm supposed to live. But I'm going to decide right now that your word is a lamp unto my feet. It's the authority for my life. And I place myself under its leadership. And I want to follow what you say about me. Just make that decision. And Father, we thank you for your grace. None of us sitting here today, none of us in Missouri City are living out your word perfectly. Thank you that you show us mercy and grace. But may we, as we read, become convicted of the way we should go and turn our lives in that direction. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hey, great day today.